Guys, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, just before we get into the details of like today's uh, episode, why don't we just go around the table, um, starting with Utex, and uh, just give us a quick background about yourself and, and Power Athlete. Sure, I'm Tex McQuilkin, the Director of Training and Education at Power Athlete and co-host of the premier podcast in strength and conditioning, Power Athlete Radio. And we met just about a year ago at Jay, Jay DeMeo's The Seminar up in Richmond, Virginia, man, and I feel we, we hit it off and you were a guest on Power Athlete Radio, episode 343, and we had a great time, great conversation, and part of that conversation was Luke Summers. Hey, everybody. My name is Luke Summers. I uh, run operations here at Power Athlete with John and Tex, co-host Power Athlete Radio, uh, background, a little bit of background, grew up playing sports, which eventually brought me into coaching at a CrossFit gym, which eventually led me to a seminar I'm sure we'll talk about today, the CrossFit football seminar. And um, I guess an early life crisis to quit my corporate gig and become a full-time coach out in Southern California, where the humble beginnings of Power Athlete were just festering at the time, 2011. Festering uh, is a powerful word. Is it a powerful word? It's a powerful word. <laughs> What's I don't even know what it means to be honest with you. Oh, it's like whatever Texas got going on in his toenails. Oh, I got, I got Burrow. that too. I got that. But uh, no, Chris, in been working with John and Tex ever since, and excited to be on the show, man. Thanks for having us on. Um, John Wellborn, CEO for Power Athlete. Um, what can be said that hasn't already been said before? But uh, like I said, CEO, uh, creator. Um, we started this journey really in two thousand and nine. After a you know interesting chance meeting with uh, CEO of CrossFit Greg Glassman and the need for some really solid strength conditioning and just the observation of that I saw to be a lot of bad strength conditioning uh, coming out of the NFL, so started Power Athlete and we've been rocking and rolling and for most weeks get to be a guest on Power Athlete Radio, friend, friend of the podcast Power Athlete Radio. <laughs> uh, really, what I, I like to refer to myself is. Uh, I like to think of myself as more of the life fest because without me, you guys would be drowning and sinking all the time. So I feel like I'm just really that's, the one that keeps it up nice and buoyant. That's so weird. Tex and I were just <laughs> talking the other day. Remember Tex, <laughs> how we feel like we're the floaties that go on your tiny little arms and keep you above water. big guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, John is six foot six, 280 pounds of chiseled marble. It's uh -huh. like the Greek gods themselves lowered a block of marble from the peak of the Himalayas and just Michelangelo himself huh? carved that physique out of there for you, big guy. Thank you. I appreciate that. There you go. Right, I don't thanks. know. I don't know where to go with that one. <laughs> well, that's yeah. the show. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, what you're seeing is uh, hundreds of opportunities to sit in front of microphones with uh, these two schlubs <laughs> and duke schlubs. it out. Oh yeah. No, that's terrific that's, schlub. Yeah. That's how I refer to you guys. Well, actually that's how Callie refers to you guys as the schlubs, John and the schlubs. I prefer slouch. <laughs> you don't worry. You're a tremendous slouch. So I think uh, just having so many opportunities to interview people and discuss and talk and banter and whatnot, that there becomes like a certain shtick to use Chris McWilkins term that just gets beaten repeatedly uh, just to come on the radio and just try to be funny and entertain people. And I guess uh, to give even preface to that, John, remember before the podcast, we traveled around the country together, teaching 40 hundreds to 60 hours at a world. time. Yeah, yeah around, around the, world. the world. Right, right. Yeah, we taught hundreds of seminars. Doing seminars. So yeah, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of layover time. Yes, with one another. So, <laughs> now, I mean, a lot I'm, of bad jokes. I, I'm a big fan of the uh, of the podcast, and uh, listen to it. Listen to it for a long time. Actually, when I was kind of first starting out, I suppose uh, within strength and conditioning, and picked up a lot of things from kind of the blog and the podcast as well. I remember. In particular, I think it was, I couldn't tell you the number, uh, the episode it was, but it was like Brian Mann's episode. I had like a seven hour drive down the country getting stuck in. That was kind of a real interaction with velocity based training. That one kind of real sticks with me. Um, and then obviously, which we're going to get into today at some point, but talking about the athletic position and that kind of base position. Um, and I've still got the image in my head of John, you just yanking on that guy's, uh, you, you yanking on that guy's leg just to prove that there is a good kind of athletic position. But before we, um, before we get into that, um, so Luke, you kind of touched on kind of the humble beginnings, I suppose, with, with CrossFit and things like that and how you got started. Why don't you just get into like the background of the company and, and how it did all get going? 
Sure, I'll, I'll start kind of, we'll do a little time hop, a time fold. I think they call it, what do they call it in movies, Tex? The well, fold, I'm excited for time. Chris Nolan's movie to come out. Mm -hmm. There's some time folding in that, Tenet. The, uh, so, but Chris, to give you a, a time point, you know, when we talk of the, the proverbial black and white of power athletes standing up, the website really stood up in like 20, in 2013 is when we really started to, the brand started to take a foothold within the space and we decided to pivot the previous entity, which was CrossFit Football, and start to focus on really ramping up the daily training. Prior to that, 2008, John will, can give you a little more background in just a bit, but John was approached by CrossFit HQ to, to stand up a specialty seminar focused on sports performance and was coaxed into naming it CrossFit Football because of his experience playing professional football 10 years. And that was an educational seminar that spun and spun and spun. And really, it was paired with an online training program called CrossFit Football, where thousands of people were logging on each day, following a hard, heavy, and fast version of what would be perceived as CrossFit, constantly varied functional movements performed at high intensity. But John sprinkled in a lot of the, um, the principles of sound, strength, and conditioning into there versus random. There is a little more periodization, not in the classical sense, but things were more structured. And people saw tremendous gains. I went to that seminar. I followed that program. And that's where a light switch flipped on for me. And I realized I wanted to deliver this message. And I was able to join the team and text similarly right along the same time, just different part of the country. But we knew we wanted to spin that program out because we were sick of being the name carried CrossFit in it. And we were a little bit beholden to those principles as well, which they have their perks and they have their limitations, just like anything in, with respect to the individual you're trying to train or coach. And we needed a platform to launch our flagship program called Field Strong. And that power athlete was just, it made sense. That was going to be the home of Field Strong, which then spun into Jack Street, which was a more hypertrophy focused program. Then Grindstone took a foothold. And then what did we launch at? Bedrock was oh, in yeah. there Bed as well. Bedrock right after Field Strong. That's actually. right. And then, uh, you know, we have our, our flagship programs and we would probably consider those five or core. And then to, as CrossFit football eventually spun down, the home for that became Johnny Wad, right? <laughs> Which was more that Wad workout of the day kind of CrossFit centric deal. But Power Athlete was born out of that. But that was the need. But as we continue to grow, we were still doing seminars. And at our core, all three of us will admit Power Athlete and this trio here were educators and coaches. We're not just programmers. John has a tremendous ability to write these programs for people that they can follow for years and years and years, try train as hard as they can and still maintain a high level of training, not get beat down too much. So, I mean, the dude's got a gift, but that eventually turned spun into education as well. And we launched our power athlete Academy, right? So the origins were in that training space, but now we're really in that coaching coaches space as well. And that's one of our missions now. Nice. So how is that kind of, we're obviously moving a little bit more towards the academy. How is that developing with the, I suppose this one's maybe directed a little bit more at you, John. How's that developing with the academy and like the power athlete methodology, the education model? How's all that kind of coming together? Uh, like, it's a really interesting uh, kind of humble beginning in a lot of ways in that um, uh, playing in the NFL, you're kind of encapsulated in this bubble for professional athletes. All your friends are professional athletes. You train in places that just professional athletes train. And there's like a certain level of not only like competence, but just attention to detail and the way people do things. And, um, you know, for me, there was a lot of black and white. There was the right way and the wrong way to do things. And uh, if a movement did not have carryover into athletic performance, if I couldn't see some like A plus B equals C, then I just discarded the movement and, um, you know, coming from a, a fighting kind of boxing martial arts background, I was always a big Bruce Lee fan of, you know, Jeet Kune Do, you know, uh, keep what's useful, discard what's useless, you know, constantly evolving also from the Dune books, you know, the code of the Fremen is kind of a deal if you know any of that stuff. Um, so as a NFL player, I had a very unique opportunity to train at the highest level and then go out and compete at the highest level against some of the best athletes on the planet and see whether or not exactly 
my training was successful. And so when you do that over about 10 years, you end up creating a pretty, what I like to think of like a very, very tight, almost like bulletproof system of training and the way to do things. And everything came back to this idea of, you know, perfection of movement, the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish a known or novel task, you know, where to start universal athletic position, step squat lunge. I mean, all of these things were really born out of sport and me trying to figure out how to be more efficient so that I didn't ever lose. And I had a really interesting realization where uh, I was watching offensive line play and defensive lineman rushing, and I realized that the offensive lineman lost when his technique broke down, but more importantly, he got out of position and couldn't recover. And I had this kind of strange epiphany where I'm like, well, if I can maintain my position through space, you know, in a dynamic nature, you know, moving 100 miles an hour, and I can maintain my position even under force when that individual applies force to me, I get hit and tries to get me out of balance. The longer I can maintain my technique and my position, the better chance I have winning. And it turns out to be about 99.999%. And so it became just very simple for me. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to maintain my position. I'm going to maintain my te- uh, technique longer than the next guy. Um, but you have to be able to train to do that. So I used barbells in the training that I was doing within the weight room to challenge posture and position in those movements and those, you know, snapshots that I, w- I figured out were useful. And that's really where this thing started. So um, when I retired from the NFL, uh, I kind of was at an interesting crossroads. Um, I had a uh, plan to go to law school before I ever got drafted. So I graduated from Berkeley, worked on my master's and then was uh, applying to go to law school drafted and figured I'd do that for a year or two. I didn't really know how long people play in the NFL and I figured the average is a couple of years. So I'll make some dough and then I'll go back to law school. That turned into 10 years. And so when I retired, um, you know, retired due to injury, had surgery and I was on the couch and I was, you know, hitting up law schools, you know, figured out that my LSATs, which are the interest exams were only good for five years. So I was going to have to retake that. And I was reaching out to a tutor so I could, you know, tutor my LSATs and start getting all the, you know, stuff and figuring out what enrollments were. And that's when I, got a phone call from Greg Lassman, CEO of CrossFit, about starting a sports-specific version of CrossFit. So every other specialty seminar on the planet teaches one element of CrossFit, like Olympic lifting, the Olympic lifting CrossFit. Running, there's some form of running in CrossFit. Uh, Gymnastics, there's gymnastics movements. They were asking me to do something different. They were actually asking me to create my own version of CrossFit based on strength, power, and speed for uh, field sports. when CrossFit and Greg Lassman asked me, do you think that the way we do CrossFit benefits sport? I said, no, because it doesn't adhere to what I understand about athleticism. Nothing you're doing is fostering developing athleticism. And then I broke down and explained to him how I understand athleticism and how we understand uh, sport performance and doing nothing but bilateral hip hinging in a sagittal plane does nothing to improve performance for athleticism. Now it increases fitness, but you can get extremely fit doing pretty much anything if you do it a little bit more today than you did yesterday. At that point, he's like, great, go do it. So uh, I left there 30 days later, I came back with a program, which was uh, really just a, what you'd see in terms of like a conventional strength conditioning template and program that you would see at a collegiate level. I just had the ability to translate it into CrossFit speak. So, you know, strength work became strength wads, uh, daily wads became, you know, the metabolic conditioning cycles. I mean, we did change the direction. We did sprint. I mean, every, like literally take your standard strength conditioning template, you know, and translate it into CrossFit so that people could understand every minute on the minute, yeah. AMRAP, 21, 15, yeah. nine descending pyramids. Yeah. Um, all, I mean, rounds into the sets and just stuff like that. Yeah. 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 I just, I just basically just put it into Google translator and spit it out. <laughs> And all of a sudden, people started following the program. I think we got like 16,000 hits that first day in like 100 plus countries. And uh, everybody that that was following the training program was loving it because, you know, it was getting people in love with barbells. They were doing multiple training sessions a day. People were really starting to hit it. And then we, uh, then the next question when they saw how how it exploded was, uh, when are you teaching the seminar? Now, I've always sat on the other side as an athlete. I was never a coach. Um, you know, and, uh, I just didn't never viewed myself as a coach. So it was really hard for me. Um, well, not really hard, but I had to really sit down and put a lot of thought into like, what do I want the people to learn? Like, what do I want to teach them? And the problem that I run, run into is as a, you know, NFL player and, uh, you know, playing at that level, you become kind of elitist in a lot of ways. So going out and teaching a seminar to people that are, 
you know, uh, own gyms and, you know, maybe not, you know, within the 0.001% of the population, that was really interesting because I was used to dealing with a certain level of, I guess you could say like proficiency. So we go teach this seminar and things that I figured were very simple and didn't need to be said, like, uh, you know, it, it was, it was eye opening to say the least. So we would get in and I would talk about, you know, Hey, the reason that we barbell back squat and put the position in this way. And the reason that I do this with toes forward and everything isn't because I'm trying to get you to back squat the most. I'm trying to get you into a position to challenge posture and position through full ranges of motion using a barbell as the implement to challenge that position. So now it's not about how much you squat. It's how well you squat in the way that I want you to do it. And we said, people come in, well, I do this type of squat. I'm like, I'm not telling you to squat that that's a bad squat. I'm just telling you that I need you to squat this way to challenge the position because we're going to start in this UAP universal athletic position, which is if you know, you're going to show the picture with Chris up on the screen share is really how every single sport, whether it's tennis, linebacker, running back, I mean, every sport, the reason it's called the universal athletic position is because everybody starts in that position. You know, if you look, you know, feet are outside the shoulders. Um, Chris, do you want me to share it now? Yeah, please. Let's get it up there so the uh, viewers yeah. can see what we're talking about. Enhance. Sorry, John. There we go. Sorry. I think we're cruising. We good. So uh, if you look at Chris's position, toes are straight ahead, obviously, because he's moving in that direction. Knees are over his end steps. His hips are back. His chest is forward over his knees. And he's in a position with his head up. And from this position, he can go right, left, front, and back, everything. He can take on a blocker. If somebody goes to cut him, his hands are in the right position. That position is how every single athlete, whether it's the guys in the batter box, the guys at second base, tennis, whatever it is, everybody starts in this position. And so if that's the initial introduction to the conversation and that's the position that people start into, the next step or the next position they go into is usually a step. And then from there we get into you know running, jumping, and then we can really transition through all of our X, Y, and Z axis and our primal movements. But what was amazing to me is that people – didn't understand that this is really the foundational movement. This is the keystone. So if you're going to barbell back squat, I, I need to challenge this position. And so what I saw people doing is back squatting in such a way that they were challenging a position that I know did not benefit them athletically. So th imagine as an NFL player and like, you so know, like training with like the world's best coaches and all this other deal, like you, you develop a system that you see works and then you go out and you test it. And then you go teach a seminar and you're having people argue and try to tell you the right way. Well, I can squat more weight here. John, and, we, we've had, we've had, we know what you're talking about. Can you explain some of the positions you, you saw? Yeah. Well, um, like the one where people are carrying the bar real low and they're doing this kind of like weird kind of hit back vertical shin. Good morning. And like just the fact that, uh, you know, nowhere when sprinting change of direction or anything, do you ever see anybody with a vertical shin? So, you know, you got to have positive shin angle, the knees always over the toes, whether you're sprinting, change of direction, whatever it looks like. In the UAP, uh, the Chris is kind of set up, his knees are a little bit uh, like, you know, should be shoved for a little positive shin angle, but the minute he takes a step, his knee's going to go over his toes. So we saw a, par a problem where people were squatting and the knees never came anywhere near the toes. The other thing we saw was that people were driving their knees out really hard and the knee was going outside the toe box. Like narrow stance. Yeah, like a through. narrow stance driving it outside the toe box. And the most powerful position for you, the strongest position for not only lifting, but for uh, change of direction and all the other things when we start looking at dynamic movement is the knee should track over the instep. So the knee should, even though you want to drive your knees out, the problem is, is in, there was a big discussion in CrossFit and they actually had Kelly Starrett up to argue with CrossFit HQ and which was ironic that they didn't invite me because uh, this came from me and Kelly got it from me. So what they were teaching was the idea of driving the knee out of the toe box. But the problem is, is that you want to drive your knees out. But if, you're, if your knee's going outside the outside of your foot, your stance is too narrow. So you need to open up your stance, go a little bit wider, drive the knee out so it tracks over the instep. The other thing, too, is a lot of people were driving their knees outside the outside of the, of the foot, but they were lifting their big toe off the ground. And if you can't put your big toe on the ground, you'll never get your glute to fire. So the toes straight ahead in that position, big toe on the ground, knee over the insteps, activating, activating it, driving it out. I mean, that's just, that's the foundation of athleticism. And so I'm going to these seminars and I'm teaching and I realized that it wasn't their fault. It's just the fact that they were uneducated. And so our mission became to educate people that did not necessarily believe or want an education. And so what we would do is we would bring people in and developed what I call the three pillars where we would come in and fucking smash them. 
and show them all the things they couldn't do with just even some ba basic isometric holds and using our ISO stability test like a dead bug. Mm -hmm. And then we would get into lifting and I would change everybody's movement. And all of a sudden, as people started squatting, like, wow, my knees don't hurt. Wow, I feel so much more exposed. I mean, it was like, like, a, like, like we were giving medicine to people that had never had aspirin. And the paradigm shift, John, as well, Chris, and anyone who's familiar with CrossFit is the training is the test. As you enter that space and you refine it, either you find training as an adult or like the, the training becomes the test. And you would, through the paradigm shift at, at us, at my first seminar, the training's not the test. The test is competition within the framework of training for sport. Mm -hmm. So, so you use the competition. If, so like the competition lens of your sport, like the, the weight room is just the GPP, the tool that allows me to basically like hone my skills, sharpen my blades, prepare my, my, you know, my implements that I'm going to use for destruction, let's say, uh, like sharpening my hammers, this, I mean, and then taking those out and actually using them in a meaningful way and seeing if the prep work that I did was beneficial. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, so it, it was, uh, did you it was find really much, just, like, much, much pushback with that then from oh, different yeah. athletes and stuff? And then what yeah. Uh, uh, yeah the, uh, that, can you just talk about maybe the, as yeah, you I mean, get the pushback, like maybe the difference between like the Olympic squat compared to the, the squat that you're putting forward in that toes, like knees out, toes straight ahead position, firing the glute. Like why is that better than maybe kind of slightly externally rotating or, or whatever that might be? Well, that position that, that you're in, like, um, I'm not necessarily training Olympic lifters. My deal was to use the Olympic movements to train athletes. And the positions that the people were, were most advantageous within the Olympic lifting weren't positions for, uh, like, change of direction. So you think about, um, you know, the Olympic movements, straight up and down, you know, nothing but uh, bilateral hip hinging, unless you, I guess, unless you jerk it, um, like a split it's jerk. Split. But if you think about it, like it's straight up and down, big pull. And there became a lot of like romance with the idea that like uh, a, that Olympic lifting well was synonymous with athleticism. Um, really good athletes are, are usually pretty good Olympic lifters, but Olympic lifting is not the vehicle to develop athleticism for an unathletic person. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. Like when, um, like, uh, you know, and, and not to take uh, anything away from um, Chad, wait, uh, no, uh, Chad. Uh, the Olympic lifter. Oli Chad. Chad yeah. Smith? Uh, yeah, Oli Chad. Um, mean, he was yeah. born with a club foot and was a really, really good Olympic lifter. And when we went and taught that seminar at Reebok, he was like, man, I'm really glad I got Olympic lifting because I couldn't change direction or do anything athletic, uh, athletic uh, because of a club foot, but yet extremely talented Olympic lifter. And it was kind of like as we got up and gave the talk, he's like, I'm, I can Olympic lift and I'm a good athlete, but I have a, you know, a physical uh, limitation. It doesn't allow me to do these things, but I can still do this and not to take it, you know, not say anything bad about that, but he like, like there's a good example. So, um, I also didn't necessarily coach full variances of the lift. I was more interested in the power clean power snatch because it was a longer pole and I was more interested in how people were catching in like a 45 above parallel. Uh, the idea of, you know, constantly catching a bar below parallel into a position that no sport ever plays in didn't really make a ton of sense, but we were squatting below parallel. So, I mean, there's just a lot of, it was just a lot of tweaking to the standard CrossFit kind of like dogma. And the interesting part was as the, the program, the free program we were giving out started to kind of take hold and more and more people were using it over the years. We traveled to all of these different places from the Arctic Circle to New Zealand and uh, had these people on our seminar. And it was really interesting. Within minutes, we knew when we showed up to, to teach a seminar who had been following our training and who hadn't. So we would do a little thing like who's who's followed it for a week, who's followed it for a week, who's never heard of it, this, and we could literally pick out because the people that did our training were like orders of magnitude better than the people that didn't. Mm -hmm. And we came to the realization like everybody that didn't do our training had the same dysfunction. So when you see thousands of people do the exact same thing wrong over time, and then you understand, you know, their root, where they came from, what their training looks like, how it is, like we would have people show up and smash the seminar where we were like, dude, this guy rocks. A lot of times they're like, no, I've never crossed it before. I was a college athlete. Um, we had people that came in who had never done anything physical before CrossFit came in and couldn't do anything, couldn't sprint, couldn't change direction, couldn't do anything because they had never been exposed to it because that isn't the system. So uh, really what you see with the methodology and what you see a lot with uh, power athlete just came from, you know, not only 
you know, my elitist background, but me taking that lens and putting it on to a general population and then teaching hundreds of seminars around the globe and then realizing that there were these universal athletic truths, there were these universal uh, principles that you had to adhere to for sport and athleticism. And, uh, you know, and then going back in, you know, reading Zadiskorsky and Science and Practice and understanding, you know, Mel Siff and Verkashansky and, you know, all that really cool stuff was great. And, you know, and then also, um, you know, coming back from a, a background of powerlifting as a young kid and, uh, you know, the old guy that trained me, George Zangus, was, you know, contemporaries and friends with uh, Fred Hatfield. So the idea of compensatory acceleration and just a lot of these principles and a lot of these things that I hung my hat on for years, uh, I would get up and discuss and people had never heard of it, knew nothing about it and didn't understand any of this stuff. So I got frustrated and really it was what I tacked, uh, text and I initial kind of, I guess you could say like really the fire that lit underneath us for the methodology course was going to the CrossFit football seminars and realizing how uneducated people were in terms of strength and conditioning. These people mm -hmm. own gyms, they were coaching athletes, they were high level and they just didn't even understand the most basic, or they hadn't been exposed to the more basic of principles. So we wanted a course that somebody could take that would teach them everything we needed them to know so that when they showed up to an actual seminar in person, we could like, I, I could dispense with half a day of trying to convince people, well, not even convince, but like getting into basics, being like there's three muscle contractions, eccentric, concentric, and isometric. You develop stability with an isometric contraction. How many of you guys use isometric contractions? None of you guys. How many of you guys focus on eccentric loads as a way to build more muscle? Like, like I, I might as well have been speaking Greek. But that's another bash on the squat because we were seeing a lot of free fall and bounce off your calf squats that – you take that approach into a change of direction. That's an ACL right there. Is yeah. So there issue, was just, is that an issue with, sorry, is that an issue with kind of maybe the, the CrossFit element there coming in and it's just obviously that very sagittal plane dominant kind of bouncy reps almost. Is that the carryover not, that you're seeing or not, not specific to CrossFit, but there is a lot of coaching and then defaulting to people do what they're good at. Mm -hmm. So they're able to get more weight by that technique. Mm -hmm. And so they won't listen to their coach as an approach or our technique because it makes them look weaker. So and not to, taught, it just happens to make its way in. To jump in on what Tex is saying and going back a little bit, Chris, what you're asking, if you really, if we would take individuals aside at times when we get to the practicals and they wouldn't heed the advice, they would just kind of go back to their default. And you ask them, why do you X, Y, or Z? Why do you squat with toes out? Why do you squat narrow stance, knees out over your toe box? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? The common response was, I can get range of motion and or I can lift more weight. Then we loop back. Hey, the training is not the test. The training is a vessel to performance. Case in point, if you got a guy on the pitch who's bombing towards the sideline and is able to plant and redirect his force faster than his defender, he makes that guy look like a fool. And not one person in the stands in the commentary box on the sidelines are going, wow, I wonder what that guy squats because the squat didn't allow him to redirect dampen, redirect that force. What did is his position and the amount of reps in the weight room that allowed him to create that default position to make a fool of his competitor, whether he knew it or not. Right. Yeah. And similarly, if you're the guy on the opposite side of that, you want to be able to redirect that force more efficiently and react quicker which is a product of position, then the offender, offensive player, so that you can make the play and not look like a fool, right? The, the other thing that I became kind of romanced with in this idea of, um, and I think it really came from a conversation I'd had on an airplane with a guy who was a scout for the uh, LA Rams, at the time yeah, yeah. St. Louis Rams, was the idea of can athleticism be taught? Can you fake somebody into thinking you're more athletic than you are? And uh, that was a really interesting point that resonated with me because I was like, 100%, I, if I can take a person with minimal athleticism and I can make them more athletic, if you understand the components of athleticism, and if we can break down the components, we can sharpen and change and fix all the pieces and then reassemble it in such a way that we can improve upon what they know to be doing. And I think up until that point, there had just been this kind of general kind of uh, attitude that, you know, um, athleticism was kind of like the hand of God. 
if God put, you know, whoever the creator, you know, genetics, whatever it is, puts the hand on you, you're athletic. And it's kind of like duck, duck, goose, like this guy's athletic, this guy's not, you know, and I think people feel felt that, um, you know, I'm, I'm just not, a, uh, I'm unathletic. There's nothing I can be done. And I completely disagree. I think if you can understand the components of athleticism in terms of the way that we designed it here at Power Athlete and the way I defined it, you can break the pieces down and through the training by understanding step, squat and lunge and the primals with push and pull, we can develop all of these different positions and, and points of athleticism if you break it down and then reassemble them in interesting and creative ways within the training and then force somebody to go out and use what they've learned and what they've ingrained and practiced within the weight room in a meaningful way on the field for success. And uh, that's really become, you know, for, for everything we do with the battle of the bullshit, um, that idea of developing and fostering athleticism, I think is really what power athletes contribution will be many, many years from now that up until this point, people became so focused on fitness, which is great. People need to increase their fitness, but the ultimate pretty girl in the room, the ultimate Ferrari in the parking lot, you know, the ultimate, you know, you know, uh, uh, when you pull a wad out of your pocket, that's packed with hundreds, that will always be athleticism. Trump, it'll, trump card. Yeah. It'll always be the trump card. All things being equal, the most athletic person tends to be the most successful for sure do you, do you think with that because there's been a bit of talk recently uh, and i know joel smith talks about this a little bit and, and uh, adarian bar in sometimes we overcoach or maybe not even overcoach we just try to input too much instead of just letting the maybe that freak athlete for example just do what they do best what yeah i mean there's in philosophy on that yeah i mean there's a, a pretty interesting observation that um uh, like don't let your coaching get in the way of success of your athlete. Like the idea that, you know, and we used to see people all the time uh, come to the seminar who were really good movers. Uh, they'd get underneath the barbell, they would go to squat, they'd go to lift weights and it wasn't perfect the way I wanted it, but they moved very well. And then people be like, well, what about them? What about them? And I'm like, at the end of the day, uh, I'm not going to fuck somebody up that's already moving well. Now, if you're moving poorly, we're going to fix it. But I think that there's, uh, you know, some people have some inherent gifts and they've developed some things. So I think as a coach, uh, if you see that somebody is, is real good and, and they're you know, pretty switched on, they're wired up correctly, uh, it almost, I guess, would be considered a negative for you to overcoach them. I think a lot of times you just got to you know, let people do what they do. So I think uh, a lot of times, and especially, dude, you, you see this so much, especially high-level sports, because you get to the top of the pyramid. You, know, you go to the NFL – is, uh, is an NFL strength coach really developing players? No. They're in there to have them lift weights so they don't get hurt. That's the job. Number one job of any, any professional NFL strength coach is don't get anybody hurt in the weight room. Uh, if you can't show up the first day and be a player, you're probably not going to be around there long enough. So it's a really interesting thing. Like the NFL is not into development. They're into players and players play. And if you can't play, you're not going to be there. So that's a, a big problem we run into when especially – people are looking at like, oh, you know, I'm going to follow this program that's put out by this NFL strength coach or this professional strength coach. A lot of times I don't put much value in those programs because they're working with the best athletes. And if your goal is not to get people hurt, are you really forcing and driving, you know, adaptation at a younger age? So it's, uh, it might be that the pro program you're saying, John, is not enough juice to get a genetic trash can better, sure. right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. A lot I of think times. especially when it comes to the, to the movement stuff as well, which obviously we'll get into, but at that top end of the pyramid, the, the one percenters or 0.1 percent is like what's realistically like all that stuff's already been taken care of to a degree or hopefully. And that's why they're there. Yeah. Um, moving on just slightly then from that, uh, maybe moving over to you text, we talked obviously a lot about movement and mm. kind of, I, I saw obviously you guys talk a little bit about movement, uh, not movements. Can you just get into like, what does that mean? And how do you progress your movements? We talked a lot about the, that universal athletic position, uh, which I'm a big fan of, and especially with the way you obviously transfer it into the squat, you, uh, understanding how to apply force and things like that. Like, how, how does that whole system, without giving away the secret, um, how does that system work? We'll, we'll give it all away. Yeah, we, we give everything. Yeah. Share text? <laughs> yes. Hey, so, Chris, I'm going to do another screen share. Okay, buddy. Yep. Yeah, good. Luke's, Luke's going to share our screen here. So, the teach movement, not movements, that came from being on the road so much. So it came at a different, little bit different track than Luke coming from a collegiate strength conditioning world and then working with John under the umbrella of CrossFit. So I would go during the week to 
and NSCA coaches and just get bashed, literally bashed for being associated or affiliated with CrossFit. I'm like, it's not CrossFit. We're teaching strength and conditioning. <laughs> well, and then going, hold on, and then going to weekend CrossFit seminars, and all of a sudden there was this boiling battle between NSCA is now the enemy. It's not functional movement. Yeah. So I had these yeah, two conflicting parents fighting that I was in the middle of. I'm like, ah, come on. Just go home, have a gallon of ice cream and a, a pint of bourbon. Be like, how can I get these kids? It's yeah. like your tears are kids? making it so salty. Now you're having salty caramel yeah. from your tears. <laughs> so <laughs> I was forced into a lot of arguments and had to synthesize a lot of information and distill it down to one or two quips. And one of my favorite ones was teach movement, not movements, because we would get into it with the collegiate strength and conditioning coaches of they're coming from camps. Oh, I'm a powerlifting camp. What or but, I am an Olympic lifter. But so didn't they were, it, um, uh, and, and I, I remember you hit me up when somebody battled you on like, well, is the front squat better than the back squat? And we were like, it's an x-axis movement. Yes. So it's, it's every which way. It's my biggest thing was the, the powerlifting when coaches were getting their suits and then like stealing racks from weight rooms. So if I was working with women's crew, I would be minus one rack because somebody loaded up their powerlifting suit with a bunch of weight that, oh, I can't use that rack because they don't value, one, my women's crew team, and two, they got to stretch out and prep this ply suit. So a lot of arguments like that, but it led to a quip, but based off of John's definition of athleticism that he mentioned earlier, a key component was the seamless and effortless combination of primal movement patterns. And that's what I want to touch on now, which you see up on the screen, primal, not in necessarily CrossFit speak of paleo, paleo diet, <laughs> no, foundational movements. And so there are seven foundational movements found in the human body, four for the upper, where we have a vertical push paired with a vertical pull, and then a horizontal push paired with a horizontal pull. And then for our lower, this is where things get fun, an X, Y, and a Z axis. What you see on the screen there is a bowl of soup. Imagine that's your pelvis. And then from our left to right, we have an X axis of rotation that drives through our pelvis, and that would be a hinge. Our pelvis is rotating along that hinge. We generalize it as a squat, but think of this as a deadlift, power clean, snatch, front squat, box squat, power kettlebell athlete, swing, squat, RDL, kettlebell, RDL, RDL jump, deadlift, bilateral jump, uh, and then if kipping we, pull up, what yes, else? Uh, everything, circle pull ups. But if we peek at the the CrossFit methodology quickly, they only teach these X axes of rotation for the lower body. So then we have also in sport, we know lunging position, the first step forward or the first step back. That's going to be a Y-axis rotation going straight in the top of my pelvis, and then my pelvis would rotate to the left and the right along that Y-axis rotation, representing a lunge position. And then finally, we have a Z-axis rotation. Imagine my head-on position, view of my pelvis, through my belt buckle comes this Z-axis rotation, and my iliac crest would tilt up to the left and the right. So that would be like a march or a classic sprint position. I knee acceleration. I knees acceleration. So we have these components, these foundational movements of athleticism, but we know athleticism is an infinite combination of X, Y, Z axis rotation mm -hmm. through all three planes of motion. We can train athleticism by then focusing on the squat. Okay, we've nailed and mastered the squat. We're going to overload it and drive structural adaptation and neurological adaptation. Then we have our lunge. I take my 400 pound squatter and I've seen this at the university of Texas weight room where we take a four to 500 pound squatter and have them have an isometric holding of a lunge position and completely collapse. So how can I trust that offensive lineman? Okay. Well, we found a gap in their Y and their lunge. We would help supplement, accessorize and strengthen and power and do all the magic stuff with the program through the lunge and as well as the step up. So if we can identify a limitation between an X, we can isolate it in our program, then the Y, the same for the Z, and then we can give them an opportunity to combine the X, Y, Zs with our sprint, with our power, with our pass pro, our sports-specific skill work. So this is where we start to see where, okay, I can identify a limitation. I can isolate it within an X, Y, and Z, or left, right leg, unilateral, and then we give them the opportunity to strengthen and connect it to movement. So also with that comes to how I coach, how I teach movement, 
and we apply different themes of movement. So with the field court sport athlete, and this leads into ACL prevention, but we want a posterior chain dominant athlete. We don't want an anterior. So the anterior strength may help an Olympic weightlifter, but we know it puts a field court sport athlete in a not as protective position. Can I asterisk that too, Tex? Because this is something that we would all, Chris, people would get confused. We're not saying you shouldn't be strong anteriorly. Correct. That proportionately, if your anterior, if that's your, your compensation pattern is an anterior. Quad dominance. Right, like quad dominance, it presents a risk factor for injury. Not only that, but performance deficiency. So it's just, it's appropriating competency accordingly that the posterior chain becomes the dominant producer and dampener of force. As, as an example of a theme to teach movement. So I want my X, my Y, and my Z to be connected. I want to apply the same directions, the same cues, the same foot position. And then John mentioned earlier as an example, the knee tracking over the instep. Well, that was for the squat as John deep dove. I'm going to take that and apply it towards my lunging. So when I'm lunging forwards through space, my knee will track over. That's my expectation of execution for my athletes. And then guess what? It carries over to a lateral lunge with my change of direction or my crossover step or my open step to sprint. So I have these same coaching cues and directions. We can call them for lack of better term, but then I'm applying them to all movement and we are expanding our coaching bandwidth by not teaching the squat, by not teaching the this is how you lunge. This is how you perform a front squat. This is how you do one, two, and three movements. No, this is how we move. And I carry over the expectation. And what the best part it, and this goes back to your earlier question of our overcoaching, yes, I agree. Because our mission is athleticism. If we set our athletes up and then just set them free, and they're able to move and hold on to the cues and the directions that I gave with, a lunge or a squat or any other earlier movement, I know that I made an impact on that athlete's ability to move without me hand holding them. So set up and set free is a big part of it, but we use our foundational movements, our primal movement patterns to establish expectations of execution. And then it allows us to coach anywhere they need to, to bring them back to the foundational primal movement patterns. Mm -hmm. So everything you do there, and I know we actually talked about this at Jay's seminar, you're essentially just creating an education program for the most part. You're, oh, yes. giving, them, you're giving them these, these primal movements, and then you're saying, okay, well, um, go free. It's a little bit deeper sport. than that. Well, it, it kind of like, um, I think where this is a little bit different in terms of just like an educational platform, uh, I don't know if like people, and, and I was kind of thinking on like the, the systems that people develop and, you know, they want to teach. I think the interesting part about this is that this was really steeped in this, like hundreds of seminars going and teaching. I think we had the, uh, the rare opportunity to cut our teeth and I had the rare opportunity to go out and teach this methodology to people and get instant user feedback every week for years. So, I mean, we were able to not like, and um, you know, 20, 30, it was tens of thousands of athletes over the course of eight or nine years that got exposed to this information and we got real time feedback. And then I had to teach it to Luke and to Chris. And then these guys went out and they taught it. And the, the information was universal. And so when you apply it from, you know, from people that come from Finland and New Zealand and Australia and America and here, and you get it, the same effect and the same moments of like aha moments and the same of clarity and movement and understanding, you start realizing that this, you know, the universal athleticism, uh, is a universal language. So when we went back to the methodology, there wasn't really any, um, like the information had been kind of boiled down and disseminated and challenged and used and, you know, broken apart and put it back together and then challenged some more. So when we went to go write all this information and put it out, like it was already vetted. This stuff was already bulletproof. And I think with a lot of times when people are presenting a system and doing this, they don't have as many people to have tried it on. And, you know, the cool part is we gave away this stuff for 10 years. I mean, we I gave away free programming and tested every theory that you could ever imagine in terms of strength conditioning in a free program and then got people to give me the feedback, then traveled out and met them and got to see them in real time and present the information to them and get it back. 
So I, I think it's just, it's a, it's a unique deal that we're involved in, but I don't know how anybody could replicate it. I mean, really the only person that I've seen that has any kind of anything similar is Kelly Starrett's mobility walk. Kelly had the same thing. He had these ideas, he, you know, and he worked for me on my first CrossFit football seminar. And then he got to go out and teach his own stuff and got to work with thousands of athletes and thousands of patients and work with all these people and see a system develop for what you see with his ready state. So um, we had a, a very unique time in strength conditioning and the internet and traveling and teaching these seminars and doing it that I don't know if any, any will ever be replicated again. And, go on, Luke, sorry. Chris, and Chris, not teaching to formally educated strength coaches. We're teaching people whose entryway into the gym space and coaching space was a very abbreviated onboarding process. Like it or not, it was what it was through a weekend seminar. Yeah. And then they, they hit their trial by fire in terms of the CrossFit level one by running a gym or coaching at a gym, a very, and I don't, like this isn't meant to be necessarily a derogatory term, but a very self-serving system. Like I was a part of the, the system where like you do this because of this, which is because of this, it's kind of like a loop, mm -hmm. right? Because the training is the test where then you flatten that, that training model out and all of a sudden it's a stepping stone to something else. It's a whole different conversation and there's a lot of, it's met with a lot of ideology and passion and you need to really dial in your, your position statement on this stuff, but you also need to boil it down so low because the folks didn't have the, the, the Anatomy, prerequisite biology, yeah, the prerequisite any one knowledge. Exactly. Yeah, no, so, I mean, like even using like the words like muscle insertions and distal and like, I remember going through and we, for the initial probably two years, we had a probably about a 45 minute talk on just physiology. <laughs> Dude. Like I like, oh my it, God. It, like, yeah. and, and it was way too dense. I mean, we, we were getting into like, I, rate coding. Great. I know, I, did I know too. you did, <laughs> but, but like, it was like, my, like we got into learning like myelination and, you know, rate coding and speed and like, you know, synopsis firing. I mean, we got really jiggy into this uh, kind of like physiology talk. Because quick, on, quick note on that, Chris, I went to the fifth ever, CrossFit football seminar with John teaching and Raphael and Rob Wolf was there to give the nutrition lecture. It was cool. But then 45 people in the crowd and John asked for the three muscle contractions, like a general question to try to get some audience inquiry. Does anyone know, or is anyone familiar with the three muscle contractions? I'm a pretty shy kid, like still college, grad school at this point, look around and like uh, concentric, eccentric, isometric. Like good, doubting yeah. myself because yeah, no one else. Drop. Yeah, like it was like it was so simple that this is, has to be a trick question. But that I mean that was the group we came from. I mean within the CrossFit space, there was almost a thumbing of the nose and the idea that, in direct quote, there has not been a contribution of a strength scientist worth like worthy of value ever. And I remember hearing that statement and we're like, Until what, CrossFit. About, what about VO2 max testing? What about this? What about this? What about this? And ah, you know, and then I came to realize that the person who theorized and created it had zero foundational information, had never read any of this stuff, had never, and if he did, didn't give any attribution. But, um, you know, and it's the idea of like, you know, uh, I invented this language instead of saying, you know, it's like, oh, I, you know, we invented in English. No, English is just a combination of a whole bunch of different languages that's all kind of stolen and kind of smashed together. And uh, that was an interesting point, uh, point for me because I'll, I'll be the first to tell you I didn't invent this stuff. Uh, I've always stood on the shoulders of giants. I had amazing coaches through my entire athletic career. Uh, and a lot of bad ones too. And I think I learned more from the bad than I did the good, but then had the opportunity to own my own gym and travel and teach what I understood about human performance and the lens of how to use performance training in the weight room to, you know, fine tune that on the field. So with that, I became almost um, like, I guess the, the right word was like, there was no dogma. Like I was like, like if you think about training in terms of religions, you know, there's people like West side's a religion, CrossFit's a religion. I was kind of agnostic for everything because I wasn't in anybody's camp. I was fo focused on, I'm in the performance camp. What allows me to get better? And if standing on a BUSU ball, fucking Olympic lifting makes me better, then we're going to do that. But I know that doesn't work. Right. <laughs> Which it so, doesn't. <laughs> right. Which it doesn't. But I always said, you know, like I'll be the first, if I find some, a better way to do something, I'll be the first to, to, to change and be like, hey, you know what? This is how we were doing it. We evolved. We found a better way because I'm not married to dogma. I'm married to performance and performance is the ultimate lens. And um, the comment I'll use at the seminar for years is I'm a performance whore. I just want to 
You know, I just want to be, you know, however fast as I can get the pants off the of performance. That's what we're after. And I, <laughs> that's a fresh and that's I, a new one. <laughs> uh, the, that was a pre you guys. Uh, but the, uh, the idea, and, and I think I, I used a lot of tongue in cheek humor and a lot of like sexual innuendos and just fucking aggressive language because uh, I had to convert people quickly. We had to get buy-in. So you know what? I'd bring people in. We'd do the intro. All right, cool. Let's do our warm-up. And I would put them into a positions with just doing some basic isometric holds, iso stability, dead bug, the basic things that human beings and athletes should do that nobody could, and they would fucking get shattered on the rocks. And then from there, when they were broken down and they realized they couldn't do it, then the teaching started. But the problem became is that you have to humble people a lot of times, you know, uh, the age old, um, when the student's ready, the master appears, sometimes you have to make the student ready. Yep. And then when, and then when, you know, and, and there's a lot of art and kind of uh, flow and these guys know from teaching the seminar, man, there was a lot of art to, to being able to influence people as fast as we did. So essentially you're selling a, you're selling a product at the end of the day, but the good thing is with that, once the student is ready, then you've got a blank slate to work with. And then that's when your, your methodology can, kind of coming it to its own you know what i mean yeah. um just you mentioned your isometric kind of little testing battery that you use there just for, for maybe some of the listeners that don't maybe know what that is do you mind just touching on like one or two things there yes and these are easily if you google power athlete and the following movements you'll be able to see the breakdown and usually us i think they're they're up us coaching an athlete versus just having you view the movement. But the first in the classic is our dead bug home position. So now just putting your athlete cap on, imagine you're laying down flat on the ground and from the head to toe, you press the back of your neck into the ground, reach your head through your shoulder blades. Then you bring attention to your arms. So get your arms up like Frankenstein and have your palms facing one another like a thumbs up position. Similar mimic eventually our sprinting hand position versus palms facing your toes like a barbell gripping deadlift position. Now from here, you bring attention to your lower back and we want to, most athletes to posteriorly tilt. So they get their lower back flush with the ground and we have a straight line from their tailbone all the way through the top of their head. This establishes the spine in which we're going to challenge with movement, whether it's speed sprinting or a barbell. Now from here, we have our athletes straighten out their legs, trying to flex their quads and have a straight line from their heel all the way to their hip. We want those toes pointing forwards. So imagine that your knees are headlights and we want the headlights of your car facing forwards. Once our legs are straight, we're pulling our shoelaces towards our knees in dorsiflexing position. And we're gonna raise both legs to the point the hamstring flexibility is challenged, but not compromised. Our dead bug has the straight leg variation versus some bent knee that we've seen out in the business. Reason being is we are trying to diagnose, we are trying to assess with this movement and also use it as the corrective exercise. First meeting these athletes that we would go and teach the seminar, we put them in this dead bug home position. We can assess their, we can assess their dorsi, their ankle position. Do they have any calf issues, tight calves? because we did sprint in the seminar. So is anything going to pop up that we can see that they're going to lie to us about? Athletes always lie to us. Movement never does. So we can check out their ankle position. We can check out their hip, excuse me, their hip strength. And going back one step, their hamstring flexibility. And also how they mentally react to being in this position in an isometric hold for 60 seconds. Because we're spending 16 hours with them. Are they going to quit and give up on us after 30 seconds? Or are they going to fight like hell to hold this position? Those are the people we're going to potentially really connect with versus the other people which we have to spend more time convincing. Mm -hmm. So it's assessment not only in their movement and their preparation for the speed and the heavy-ass barbells we're going to lift that weekend, but also mm -hmm. their ability to and willingness to learn and listen and not quit on themselves or us. And Tex, I think what I'll do here, Chris, is share. we'll share a video. Yep. Sounds good. I'm not sure how smooth it'll come across, but we'll talk, you'll be able to see a little bit of what we're talking about, a visual to what Tex was talking you through. So this is one of our athletes, Amanda, a few years ago. This is our home position. Mm -hmm. And she's locked in and dialed in. She's like a national lever, level sprinter, bobsledder, like yeah, switched on Canada. athlete. Yeah. And yeah. what you see in here is a lot of very nice angles, right angles. And that's what we're ultimately 
driving for when you look at the ankle down to the hip over to the shoulder and you see how the spine is just a nice level base and what you'll see where people falter here is they just can't achieve this position and we're also in a different orientation we're supine mm -hmm. now and hinging and these things all affect the, ner the nervous system gets scrambled here and if you can't hit it here then we're not moving through space we can't effectively hit these positions through space and what yeah. we're challenging is trunk stability here spinal control through the the lower back to the top of the head and that hip control and hamstring flexibility is that the so reason this is our, you're for the, maybe the people that ha just do a dead bug in the like joe's gym and they're just kind of flapping around lying on the floor arms flailing legs flailing they're like oh that looks nothing like my dead bug is that the reason where you're using it as a as an isometric assessment essentially you're looking at I'm guessing yeah. tissue, tissue tolerance, muscle length. Yeah, what, what we're really looking for, too, is uh, that active hamstring stretch. So when you see people do, like bend the knees, what they're doing is they're putting a ton of work in, into that uh, hip flexor and also that adductor. The problem is, is that that is already a very strong movement for most people. Like when you watch people squat and you see the dynamic tibial torsion, it is usually the knees collapsing in so that they can engage the hip flexor and the adductor because they're weak in the glute. So what we're really forcing is that active hamstring stretch, and it's a really good indicator for us. And re really where this came from was I needed to bring people in and put them into a movement that was a non, I guess, dynamic nature where I could see and test them in such a way that I knew what was going to happen when they barbell back squatted. So if you can't get into this dead bud position because you're such so crappy in hamstring flexibility, then we know that's going to be a tell. We can check uh, dorsiflexion and seeing how much ankle flexibility people have from this position. We can also uh, start checking their ability to stabilize. So when we start moving the limbs independent of each other, do they have the coordination to be able to really pull apart and really stretch that stuff and stay in an active position? Then we can also check with the hands uh, shoulder flexibility. So does somebody have something that's wrong with their shoulder? Can we spot an, uh, elbow? And so it became our coaches real world, like time to assess people. So we knew who to triage when we went over and we got into the barbell back squat. So if the only thing I knew about you athletically was when we had 315, 400 pounds in the bar trying to squat a three RM. If I had to wait to that point to know exactly who you are, people were going to get fucked up. So we had to have a non-weighted, position where people weren't moving around non-dynamic uh basic iso stability tests so that we would know exactly who people were and we would put people into these positions we would take notes and then we knew when we started lifting weights these are the people that we had to triage yeah, the other the second position that we throw at athletes is going to be our spider-man in particular the vertical rotation complex I'll go ahead and share the screen again here yep. please. awesome so we, now we change our orientation back to the prone position. So you're face down, but are now we have established an expectation of execution for the spine. So you have that neutral head position. We're not lifting chin up or moving around the spine. Then we have our athletes step their foot to the outside. Go ahead and play for me, Luke. So we step their foot to the outside and pause right there. So this is our first introduction to the universal athletic position to help help show for our listeners when we hit podcast form i have a push-up position you step the right foot to the outside of your right hand i have my toes forward and my knee over my arches my instep so from the head-on position this looks like a single leg athletic position this now sets us up we have the component we are teaching the uap we are teaching our setup for the squat using the spider-man and then assessing their ability their back hip flexibility their front hip hamstring ability to stabilize and load and if you hit play for me from the side, I know we only have our head on here from the side, I can tell my athletes squat depth for that day. Why? Because when they step their foot up, is their hip crease above parallel? Yes. Then they're not going to be able to squat to a standard in a powerlifting competition below parallel. I don't care. That's not our expectation. We're going to squat as low as we can today with maintaining a good spine posture position and foot position. So now we want to separate our shoulders from our hips. Luke's has paused the screen here. So we're challenging our ability to maintain a good level hip position, like a neutral push-up, and separate our shoulders from our hips. This is a very key, important point for athletes, athleticism, any sport, separating shoulders from your hips, not just moving through the transverse plane, separating upper and lower body. So here we're assessing our athlete's ability to 
do this in this position before we go wild with the heavy weights or the heavy speed or the throws. It's also the corrective exercise, pause right there. We're also assessing, assessing groin stability. So this is two stables of position. Now our Spider-Man, we have our right foot up, our left leg is back, but now imagine we take our right hand and put it inside the right foot and hug that right knee on our right tricep and then lift the left hand to twist away from your body. Your hips stay neutral, your chest opens up the other direction and you have two bases of support. So we're really looking at the stability of the groin, the hips, and on that complex working together because we also witnessed a lot of weak AD ductors since all the sagittal plane movement in those athletes that we were working with during our, our seminar series. So this is a great tool, simple, but it shows a lot about our athlete. And so final one you, I want to encourage. I'm sorry, go on, ahead, Chris. On this one quickly, just when you do that, that assessment, how long are you holding at each position for? Are they holding that rotated position for five seconds while you're looking at anything? We, would, we put what we call a breath scheme. So we stole that term from Lauren Polivka, DPT at Atlanta, Georgia, but hold it for one, two, three breaths as long as you can maintain that position. So if it's one breath today, awesome. My expectation is we pro progress to two. If we can get through one, two, three breaths, seamless and effortless, I'm going to add another rep there. Okay. So these warm ups are not, okay, everybody's going to hit five reps. No, we're going to hit to the best of your abilities and it puts us in a position to progress. And if athlete can do this because they're like Amanda was, a, a, an amazing athlete, a lot of flexibility, stability, and speed, then we're, as coaches, are going to find different ways to challenge these primal movements through three planes of motion. And it's up to us to add resistance or add time and different modalities of stress that most of us are familiar with. But a lot of the athletes, your freshman, your sophomore, or your return after sitting outside for six months because of some pandemic, <laughs> This is a great way to test, assess, and also for athletes that this is new to, progress and build and develop their athleticism. That's going to be off of your spreadsheet program and not very measurable except qualitatively with your coach's eye and their ability to feel and move seamless and effortlessly. And is that with, I'm guessing, are you counting breaths on the, on the dead bug position as well in that, in that top straight leg position on the extended? We, we can do that. I like put time in there because we can progress time in that respect. And imagine my five RM back squat, that is time under tension that I'm able to maintain that. Mm -hmm. So we can establish within our program, if I'm hitting three sets of five, uh, linear progression, we're, we're hammering out three sets of five at the same weight. I know that I'm at least going to spend 30 to 40 hard fought seconds underneath that barbell so we can establish and program and I can coach like hell during the warm up. My expectation during the strength set. Nice. So no, I like that a lot. It's just a, like a really simple, no equipment needed movement assessment you can do with your like your freshman athletes, or you can even just throw it in there with even your kind of seniors if you need to, just to, to assess readiness almost as well uh, on a given day. Um, just moving on there, because I'm obviously I'm aware time is is passing yep. us by. Going back to the uh, universal athletic position just briefly, um, I'll give this one to kind of you, Luke, a little bit. We're going to, I want you to answer a little bit. Are the vans, I know you're obviously a big fan of the vans, are the vans linked to that? And my second question is, is the kind of the whole thing to do with the universal athletic position linked with training the feet as well? Like, do we need to train the feet in that position? Are the feet are obviously the only thing that's in contact with the floor. Are we doing a this just as to our athletes if we don't look at the feet and essentially they just run around with a flat tire all day. Yeah, I think so. It's, you know, is John, did you get it from Cal? Our interaction with the ground, 99% of the time we're interacting with the ground uh, on our feet. I don't know if Cal said it that way, but somebody, it, it very well could have been mm -hmm. that the interaction, but uh, the Vans comes from me growing up in Southern California. Yeah. Number one, they look cool, Chris. <laughs> so at six years old or five years old, my mom would take us to the van store and we would get to pick out Vans because they were cheap at the time. They were 19 bucks for shoes and our feet were growing fast. And, you know, growing up in Southern California as a skateboarder surfer, like vans were like part of our uniform. We wore them all the time. So 
The only time we didn't wear Vans is when, when I played basketball or sports, you wore your basketball shoes, but you didn't wear your basketball shoes around because that would be like wearing cleats around, mm -hmm. which is funny. Now I see people wear basketball shoes everywhere, but Vans were like our standard kind of deal. So I just wore them my whole life and then they turned into training shoes and the idea that they've been zero drop since 1966. And then all of a sudden you mm -hmm. get into this whole like airfoot deal. And what I liked is the ability to be able to wear them kind of loose. They stretch out and splay your toes so you're not confined. So the Vans just was part of my things with like Vans jeans and a black t-shirt was just kind of like the uniform and it just kind of permeated, I guess you could say. And then I guess as you start to evaluate the other shoes that are training shoes in the market, you, you, know, you, you try to understand what are you looking for out of a shoe? And with the training that we do, a few things we want, like John said, we want to respect that zero drop, which is essentially the drop from the heel to the toe, right? So an elevated heel, like a, an Oli shoe, it has its place in training. We also don't, we shouldn't rely on the shoe to train either. However, you need footwear in a lot of training facilities. So you might as well get a piece of footwear that is uh, as advantageous in terms of the desired training response as possible. A couple other of the features that Vans just coincidentally have out of the, sen out of the nature of them being a skate shoe, they're really, they have a high level of lateral support across the toe box because that's how s people skateboard. And if they bail, they bail laterally. So if your shoes are blowing out all the time, people aren't going to trust a shoe. They're also affordable. They also rely on a level of grip on the sole. So they have a honeycomb sole that has a non-slip grip that's ideal for lateral type of movement and redirecting force. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's just all these little coincidences that made them an effective shoe for the style of training that we promote. And the biggest is that they're durable for six to 12 months and they're 50 bucks. And if you go to any, uh, you know, let's say within the CrossFit space, they have the Metcon and the Nano, right? Those are hundred dollar shoes that- uh, 130 blow, bucks. 130 bucks. I know, that, I just got them for my wife. That, that when, at least when we wore them in the past, I don't, I haven't found the need to test them any like recently, but the Nano twos or threes or fours, they, they blew out in two months of training. They blew out. The lateral seams blew out and no longer became an effective shoe for lateral speed and agility. Never really wore the, the Metcons because they're 130 bucks. Yep. And it just becomes the, the best value and the most appropriate for the style of training. Now, if you have, you may have a different shaped foot and we just had a, a really uh, progressive thinking podiatrist on the podcast that's going to be published in here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, Dr. Emily. Dr. Emily Schlip. Oh, I can't remember her name. If you Schneezen Schlutel. No, if you <laughs> listeners, if you simply Google Dr. Emily and NSCA, she's got great presentations. Yeah. Out there. So there are like, there is a bit of individuality to the foot, very much like the the systemic athlete. We, there's different feet types. There's different. There's a whole lot going on down there that I don't understand. Going back to the vans, though and the UAP, uh, they're not necessarily interconnected. It just happens that there's, they're effective training shoes. Yeah, I mean, and but I think- you, and, and Yes, I, you should be training with you. And I think everybody likes their own style. Like, I'm a big uh, New Era guy. I know Luke likes- um, The, the, cla the, the classics? Yeah, I like the New Eras. Um, Chris likes boating shoes, you know, usually the women's boating shoes. They're <laughs> called low pros. Yeah, so <laughs> he likes the very, very small, which is interesting because you wear lifts in all your other shoes, don't you? They're called boots, John. What is this a roast? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys should get a discount code or something for Vans, you know? Uh, we've been today. trying for years, but uh, like, yeah, we're, day, we're, we're not really like in their target market, which is ironic because they should be. But, um, you know, I think if we, I don't know, more surfer bro. Mm -hmm. So I, and if anyone hasn't tried them out, I, I'd give it a try, man. And I, Cause I used to wear... I think I used to wear Puma. I used to wear um, Adidas. Adidas, like it would all be the zero drop stuff. But the, you know, ninety bucks, hundred bucks, and they were very. They were much more narrow. And I know yeah. people do have an issue with what, like wider feet. It may have an issue with the Vans. Chuck Taylors are fine as well. But they make different. Uh, different Vans Wits. are wider and narrower. And I think you just have to go try. Like I like I know that the new eras that I wear, like a size thirteen in those are fine like but then in some of the other ones I have to wear a 14 but I know like for that specific shoe I've worn that shoe for the last geez 38 years like forever I've worn that shoe so I know exactly what it fits like and 
you know, how long it takes to break in. And I think with, when that becomes the case, you kind of just find your style and it's just about, you know, like I know Brewer likes to skate shoes. Mm -hmm. And so everybody kind of finds their own version, their own, you know, model of Vans that kind of fits their foot the best. And they got a ton of different ones. And then in terms of training the feet, there's a lot of, a lot of jiggy stuff out there, but we also advocate if you don't have to wear a shoe and you're not doing any sort of high ground reaction type of work, you can train barefoot. Right. And that's, mm -hmm. that's as effective, if not more so than a lot of the footwear out there, including the barefoot type of stuff that's out there. I would caution you against barefoot training here in Texas because, what? uh, there's scorpions and ants everywhere. <laughs> like, like I, at least, afraid no bug. at least once a day, my kids come, uh, come in from the outside screaming about ants. And I'm like, uh, like, I mean, inside the gym is fine, but man, like yeah, I remember man. in Southern California, outdoor. we go barefoot all, you know, outdoors, yeah, but sure. Texas is a I think interesting even just walking place. around, walking around the house as well. It's something I'm trying to do a little bit more. Just walk around the house barefoot. Sure. That's, that's the easiest thing to do. Dude. Uh, the easiest thing to do is, uh, like what I call the Japanese model where you don't wear your shoes in the house. So you just leave them outside, like leave them at the stoop on the store step mm -hmm. or in the garage and go barefoot inside. Uh, we, I read an interesting research article that figured out it was like 80% less illnesses in the home when you don't wear your shoes in the house. So uh, like that one was big for us having kids. And then also the idea of I want them barefoot as much as possible. So like even to this day, if people walk in the house and don't take their shoes off, I'm kind of like, <clears throat> you know. 100%. I think, perfect. Thank you. I know obviously time is getting on. I've got three little things that I like to leave uh, listeners with. Um, the first bit, I think Luke, or I mean, anyone can jump on this to be honest with you. Just any advice for, for young coaches like getting into the game, where any strength conditioning game, doesn't necessarily have to be like collegiate or anything like that. What would your, what would your advice be? I guess self-serving, shameless self-promotion. Education is an important thing. Find a trusted educational provider. Power Athlete just happens to be one of those. I'd encourage you to consider looking at the Power Athlete methodology course. And self Self-serving, yes, but the intent was to take all of the information that John's coaches had collectively spent possibly centuries creating and distilling it down for that person so they can use it immediately because that was another piece, a challenge we had in traveling for the seminars is we had to make it actionable within 16 hours. So that I really do think that you should consider that and, and really, um, really invest in that. And, and with that said, adopt Bruce Lee's, many of Bruce Lee's principles in terms of emptying the cup. You know, don't assume you know anything. Always be willing to learn. You know, everything isn't right in every scenario. You have, you're going to have to respect the individuality of your scenario and the specificity of your athletes. So there is no broad brush approach and just, just harness that mindset as you continue to grow along your coach's journey. And with that course, it is in, it sums up standing on the shoulders of giants very well. And I like to say that it, it puts you in a position to learn. So if you are a young coach that is entering into any weight room environment, whether it's a CrossFit gym, whether it's a, a division one school, division three, or a private facility, it is the basics. So you're in a position to learn through the course, and then you can keep your eyes up and observe and see these things unfold. And then you are intelligent enough or in a position to then ask your mentor very good questions. And then it accelerates your development with that mentorship. And you can get more out of an eight week internship than you would just holding a clipboard and observing and writing that one liner on your resume. Advice I would also add on top of that, there is more in the world of performance and strength and conditioning and empowering people than Division I athletics. As cool as it is, there is so many more opportunities for you to coach. So I encourage you to ask yourself, why am I doing this? What is my purpose? And if it is truly and genuinely coaching and to empower performance, go find a facility that allows you to do that. And holding a clipboard and being number 10 on a totem bowl is not that. So there is a world of division three, two athletics. There are private facilities that will invest in you as an individual, as a coach. And then you have more of an opportunity to connect one-on-one -on -one than 
falling in love with his big dream of just being the person that cleans the floor for eight weeks just to get a one-liner on your resume. And for my fellow Americans listening, when Chris McQuoken says a world needs it, oh, there yeah. are other countries outside of the U.S. that need coaches, and that move in very oppor- like rich opportunities. High-level athletes. And that move will propel you more so than venturing to another state, in my personal opinion. Perfect. I think the, uh, the advice I tend to give young coaches is one, uh, don't abandon your own fitness. So uh, if you stop training, uh, then all of a sudden, like continue to train for out of fear that you might have to demo something. And if you always reach out and you know, grab somebody else to demo because one, you're out of shape or two, you can't do the movements, uh, that is a huge point of erosion for your credibility. Like if you're going to be a strength coach, like you don't have to have a shaved head and a goatee and fucking be a power lifter, but like look fit and be able to move well and such. So when you go demo stuff, you don't look like you're a, a you know, fish out of water. Um, you know, and it's also good for your athletes to see you in their training. Uh, the second one is don't program or ask somebody to do something that you have not already done yourself. Conditioning tests. <laughs> so, uh, you know, coming from football, like I, I just remember part of my, I guess you could say my trepidation with the term coach comes from, I associate coaches with people that screamed at me while I was working. Like uh, it's 105 degrees, we're out in the middle of the sun, we're out there killing ourselves in August in training camp, and there's some coach out there who's not wearing 40 pounds of gear, you know, is not wearing all that stuff out there screaming at it, and that dude's looking like he needs oxygen to move across the field. So for me, there was always kind of a disingenuous nature, that coach is usually the dude screaming at me when I'm working. So uh, the idea of like, uh, you know, whether you ask your athletes to do something within a program or here, like have done it ahead of time. Don't program or write things that you look and be like, I would never do this. This is fucking awful. I would never do it. I couldn't do this because it's just, it's disingenuous. So big thing. And I think why cross the football and power athlete is always done very well is we don't ask people to do things that we have in our things that I've tested and we've tested that I would never ask anybody to do because it ended so poorly. Like um, the other day I, you know, I did that uh, 10 swings on the minute. Uh, with that 203 pound kettlebell for 10 minutes, you get a hundred swings. And some guy like heard us talk about it and he tried and he sent me, he said it fucking shattered him at seven. And he, I think he used the 203 and he was like, not even a 200 pound dude. He's like, how did you do this? I'm like, well, I'm also six, six, like I'm a lot taller than you, but that shattered me to the point where I haven't gone back and even touched that 203. <laughs> like I've been like leaving it alone to get dusty. Cause that's how mad I was at it. So, but like that kind of speaking from a position of authority or experience is so valuable. And I really think that when I would go teach the football seminars, the fact that I had played at a high level and used the training and everything I was talking about was very like intimate and like personal within me. I think that's what resonates. And I think for a lot of coaches, um, especially young coaches uh, that, you know, maybe don't have the experience, like in terms of like, Oh, I didn't work with this guy and I didn't work at this place, but have a solid training background. And they've done this. Hey guys, we're going to do this. Let me take you through it. I did this earlier. This is how I want you to attack it that little bit of credibility will extend miles for your athletes because I've been on both sides. of it. Yeah. And that's actually a great point. Um, just to almost close out on that just because like, I know when I, my athletes come back on campus and they go into their off season program, I've pretty much ran through that whole off season program myself, like m- months prior them, to them getting back on campus just to know that, all right, yeah, this session's going to circle. This one's a little bit easier. And I think, if you can kind of be honest with them, maybe be like, oh, this is going to be a six out of 10 type of session, or this one's going to, this one's pushing nine or 10, then I think they understand kind of where you're coming from a little bit more, especially if you've obviously, obviously been there. Um, just, just finally, are there any books that you, you guys recommend that, um, to anyone, that you, anyone that's like reading anything at the moment? I'll take this one. Uh, I would recommend, so Robert Green, the author of 48 Laws of Power. Yeah. He's got a new book out that is extremely dense. So it's called The Laws of Nature. And if you're a fan of Brett Bartholomew's conscious coaching that goes into different archetypes of athletes, this is a progress from that because it deep dives not only athlete archetypes, but people archetypes. And I feel as you approach sport coaches, parents, and you need the social intelligence to navigate these and protect your athlete, it is a very deep dive into different personalities and help you improve your social intelligence and maybe pick up some on some quirks that you have.
that prevented you from connecting to athletes in your past or parents or coaches and just help you improve your ability to communicate and connect and then empower? Great. Um, I really think um, the talent code is a good one. I really like outliers. Um, the, uh, you know, currently um, I would say Angela Duckworth's grit is, in, is on the must, yeah. uh, the must reading list. Uh, yeah. I mean, between, you know, and then uh, the other one would be um, uh, Source by Tara Swart. Uh, that book completely altered my trajectory of thinking and in terms of like action boards and positive, uh, you know, the idea that the mind, uh, the life we formulate within our minds becomes our reality. So therefore, if that's the case, then you can form your own realities based on imagery, you know, and like, it sounds kind of hokey, but um, I never really put a ton of stock in that. And then after having her on the podcast and reading your book, it kind of altered my trajectory of thinking in terms of like parenting and like how I wanted to influence my kids, that the reality that I created became their reality, even though, you know, so it's like super impactful books. I'd go with Angela Duckworth's great. I'd go with that uh, Tara Swart, the source. I really like outliers for coaches. And then I also would take the talent code with Dan Coyle. Perfect. There you go. And then just finally, where can people find you if they've got any questions or want to get after you on social media and, or even sign up to the course? The internet. Power athletes. Head to, for, for the courses we're talking about, you can head to academy.powerathletehq.com. You'll find a free course there on warmups that goes a little bit into the nuts and bolts behind some of the stuff that Tex was covering with the Spider-Man vertical reach and with the dead bug. Social media wise, you can find the Power Athlete content at Power Athlete HQ on Instagram. And then the Luke Summers, that's me on Instagram. I'm at McQuilkin, just my last name. John Wellborn. At John Wellborn. And that's where you can find us on social. For and continued ed in this platform in which we're presenting today, Power Athlete Radio, that would be an awesome educational infotaining experience and we had chris on episode 343 i would also recommend angela duckworth john's book recommendation that's episode 301 we had owen franks all of world badass rugby athlete he was episode 347 then we had another author anders erickson whose research is all about deliberate practice and his book is peak P-E-A-K. He's at Florida State University. Which is really the basis for Dan Coyle's book, uh, which is a, having read Anders Ericsson's book, uh, Dan Coyle is a much better writer. What? Storyteller. <laughs> Dan Coyle is a, like, he, unbelievable writer, storyteller. Like, I want the source. I know. But uh, the, the other one, too, uh, really influential that Are Luke turned us on to was uh, Thinking in Bets. Uh, oh, yeah. Luke, Luke Ford is that book. That was written Annie by Duke. Yeah, the poker player, World, uh, World Series of uh, Poker Champ, and uh, wrote a really interesting book called Thinking in Bets that um, uh, has been impactful. You know, keep you, keep you out of the extremes and prepare you to learn, I think, in terms of introducing a, a thought process on how to level up. Nice. Well, thank you very much, guys. I don't want to keep you any longer. I know you're all busy, but really appreciate taking out uh, time out of your day to, to do this. Um, thank you very much. You got it, Chris. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.